777 over your prayer request right now, and we look forward to praying with you. Hey man, listen up. So April 4th and 18th, we'll meet in hospitality tent at 6 p.m. And don't forget, we host family night at 5 p.m. April 6th this month. So don't miss out. I'll see you guys there. Attention ladies, Secret Place will be meeting April 9th at 6 o'clock p.m. underneath the tent for a potluck and fellowship with Pastor Ty. And then we will meet again April 25th through the 28th for the Encounter the Glory Conference. Hallelujah. It's going to be an amazing time. We have a lineup of women of God who are going to bring the word. And I am in expectation that we will leave differently than when we came in. So join us as we encounter his glory. Is we are the high priest named Jesus that is interceding for us night and day because the accuser of the brethren right now is in the courts of heaven making accusations against you but there's a high priest named jesus that is that paid it all for you that is interceding for you and he is praying that your faith would not fail but your faith only increases when your fear of the lord only increases in the mighty name of jesus we declare these dry bones to come alive Check out this movie trailer. Has anybody seen my log? God is commissioning you to do what he called you to do. It is time for you to suit up and boot up and step into your calling because this is your kingdom calling. You don't have time to sit around on your hands. Jesus is coming again. Let your light so therefore shine before men. There's a reason why you got this far, because you're going all the way into the promise of what God has for you. Good morning, good morning. Are you excited to be at church this morning, Global Vision? Listen, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. I walked over here this morning and I started to feel this fire just stirring up in my belly this morning. And I came in and they had a scripture on the screen and then I seen Kiara's shirt and I was like, "Uh uh-oh, maybe it's time for fire to fall in this house today. But above that, listen, I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on with the nation of Israel right now, but if you you've been around here for any amount of time, you know that we stand with the nation of Israel. Listen, that is God's 
chosen land, the Bible says that one angel, the angel Gabriel, is the protector over the nation of Israel. So this morning as we come into a place of worship, I feel so stirred in my spirit that we begin to intercede with the Spirit of God this morning for His people, for His land. Because listen, the weapon may be formed against the nation of Israel, but I declare to you this morning that that weapon may be formed, but it shall not prosper in Jesus' mighty name. So Father, we enter in right now. Lord, we ask to come and be in your throne this morning, Lord, to become in your presence, oh God. Lord, we begin to intercede with your spirit in this place, oh God. Lord, we ask for divine protection over the nation of Israel, Lord. Lord, we can look out and we can see prophetically that this is everything that you said was going to happen. We know that they have those red heifers, oh God. God, we know after this week they're going to enter into their holy week, oh God. Lord, may your church stand with your people. May we begin to apply the blood of Jesus to every doorpost, oh God. Lord, would we stand? Would we draw a boundary and say, oh no, Satan, that's God's people and you can have them because of the blood of the Lamb. He's going to come. He's going to step down on the Mount of Olives. He's going to enter in through the eastern gate because 
Take that up a little bit. Let's sing that again. Good and strong. The Lord's pleased with it today. Sing it loud. seconds and just shout the victory in this house this morning he is worthy to be praised he is worthy to be praised we've already had people coming up laying things on the altar getting set free the Lord delivering folks listen you, you don't have to wait till some pre-selected scheduled time in a service at the end when the piano cranks up and everybody gets emotional to get right with God. You can get right with the Lord in this church anytime you want to. You can get saved anytime you want to. Healed, set free. You can come to these steps at this altar. Let me tell you something, this is an altar. This ain't a stage. We're not here for performance. We're here to worship the Lord and usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're in this church. That's why we're in this church. If you come for, for any other reason than you happen to accidentally be bop under the wrong tent, because this is his tabernacle, this is his place, this is a habitation for his glory. And so at any time, I don't care if it's during the worship, during the offering, during the preaching, the Lord wants to set you free, you get set free. But we, we, don't, we don't have a bunch of shame and embarrassment and guilt in this church. We tell people all the time, there's no protocol, it's just full-time altar call full-time altar call and I appreciate when the worship team just flows and minds the Lord how many believe we ought to mind the Lord God brought you here today for such a time as this you are here today for this worship service you are here today for this message you are here today in this moment in history there'll never be another moment like this one and God lets you come here God brought you here for a purpose and it was to radically, dramatically change your life, to set you free, to put you on a brand new path, a brand new trajectory. You say, well, you don't know what my past is. My name is Pastor. I don't care. I put your past where it belongs. If God can forgive and get over it, then why can't God's people forgive and get over it? We won't bring up your past around here. I'm telling you, God will meet you right where you are. It's a clean slate. Let me tell you what Jesus did with critical people, with judgmental people in church. The Bible says he knelt on the ground and he wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. When I read that, that liberated me because it reminded me that even Jesus gives me a theological right to ignore stupid people in church. Say amen right there. 
Ignore what they say about you on Facebook. Ignore what that narcissist has spoke over you from that relationship that went haywire. I'm telling you today, we lift those generational curses. We break those word curses. We speak life and life more abundantly over every man, over every woman, every child in this room. I'm telling you, today is a new day. The mercies of God are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. He woke you up for this day, not yesterday, not tomorrow day, today. You see, God's got two days on His calendar that you better mark. Only two. There's a lot of days in the year. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. But of all those years and days and months, God's got only two days circled on His calendar. Today, and that day did you hear me church today and that day and you better live today like there's gonna be a that day because you're gonna stand at that day before the fiery flaming eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ with whom we have to do and listen he's not gonna ask you what did your Facebook friends think about you doesn't matter he's not gonna ask you are you a Republican or a Democrat huh he's not gonna ask you are you a Baptist are you a Pentecostal? Do, do you wave flags? Do you speak in tongues? Do, do you shout? Do you whisper? Do you use King James or NIV? He's not going to ask you any of that. He's going to ask you, what did you do with the time I gave you for my glory? And let, let me tell you something about that day. If you waste today and stand before him at that day, you don't get to blame the pastor, you don't get to blame your ex, you don't get to blame your spouse now, you don't get to blame your kids, you'll blame the person you look at in the mirror. And I'm telling you, God brought you here for such a time as this. And God just wants to move in your life today. It doesn't have to be something up here on this platform, it doesn't have to be with a microphone in your mouth. I'm telling you, right where you are, standing, sitting, kneeling, where you are, right there in those gray cushioned seats today, God's gonna encounter you for his glory, for your betterment, but for his glory for no other reason than one he just loves you the Bible says perfect love casts out fear you know people can jump around and scream at demons all they want to but there's really only one thing that causes them to come out the authority of the love of God perfect love casts out fear if you knew how much God loved you today you would not walk in fear and torment you just wouldn't because perfect love casts out fear I've told you this before. I just feel led in my spirit to tell you right now. It ain't preaching time, so don't start timing. When we get to the offer and get back to some worship in a minute, but I'm just going to talk for a minute. I just feel like I need to. Some time ago when I was in Indiana, this drunk man was in the service, and he was obviously inebriated. And that's okay. That don't scare me. People are like, what do you do when people come to church and they ain't living right? It's what church is for, silly. This ain't an art gallery to show off everybody's problems. It's a hospital to help people where they're at, right? This is where broken people find new meaning to life. Now, by the way, brokenness is not the destination. Don't stay broken. You can get healed up. Wholeness is the destination. So you can come as you are. We just love you too much to let you stay that way. So I was in Indiana, and this drunk guy walked up. I was getting ready to go into the invitation. I was getting ready to do deliverance and start dealing with some spirits. And he walked up, and he had a big old bottle in his hand. He's just slurring all in his words. He said, I need you to pray for me, preacher. Well, absolutely I will. So I grabbed that bottle out of his hand, laid it on the ground, and I started to lay hands on him, and I was just going to go in full-blown deliverance mode like we always do. It's natural to us. right? We see a lot of that stuff. It doesn't scare us. And the Lord said, nope. I want you to embrace him and just hug him. And when the Lord said that, a prophetic download went into my heart and mind where in 1 John it says that perfect love, mature, complete, non, you know, judgmental love is what casts out fear. And so the Lord said, hug him. And so as I was hugging him, I'm telling you, to God be the glory, if I'm lying, I'm dying, Holy Ghost, strike me dead right now. As I began to hug this man, deliverance began to happen in his life without me even having to say a word. And as I hugged him, and he just felt the love of the Father just begin to just begin to shroud him. All that hatred, all that hurt, all that what I did not know 
towards his father that he had not yet forgiven and his father had been dead for a long time all that came out a little bit later all of that pain all of that lack of wholeness just in that moment all that addiction all that generational curse of alcoholism it just began to immediately like a flood be assuaged and washed away why because in that moment for the first time in his life he understood that the perfect love of God is more powerful than any addiction that you have in this tent this morning it's more powerful than any divorce papers that you get in the mail it's more powerful than that prodigal son or daughter that you're begging God to bring them back home it's more powerful than anything that you face than any sickness any disease any depression any oppression any discouragement any fear it's more powerful than anything you could imagine and I say to you today and don't even know why but God does that God so wonderfully loves you that nothing else matters when you're in this tent right now nothing else matters nothing else matters but the love of the father well I want to say just a couple of things we don't do boring announcements but I, I want to I want to give credit where credit's due we've been praying for a family most of you know that and you should know if you come here on a regular basis that uh, this of course is the main hub right this is this is our church this is our family but we have over a hundred many global vision vision campuses that meet all over the united states of america matter of fact i want you to welcome our hubs this morning as they're watching us online in church buildings and living rooms all over america right now and they are growing and god is using them mightily of course you know in the month of may we're going to a deliverance revival crusade in the philippines we're taking a hundred filipino national churches and putting them under the global vision network and so like in one month we'll jump from 100 to 200 uh, campuses of global vision all over but this week in particular we have been praying for scott and courtney evans in the dallas campus with their son malachi and uh, it, it's been a, a little bit of a touch and go situation and their their entire hub has like shown up to the hospital waiting room and just fasting and praying and, and just begging for healing. And so uh, Global Vision here in the main hub, the main campus, I want you to let the, the, the Dallas hub and the Evans family know that we're praying for them right now. Would you just give a good shout and honor to the glory of the Lord for what's happening in Dallas? And we just want them to know we love them. We stand with you. We support you. We pray for you. We fast for you. We cover you today. We cover you today. I wish some of you could grasp, grasp for a second the platform that God has given this local church. The people that are watching right now, literally around the world around the world the people that consider this their church 80 percent of them never even darken the door of this tent don't ever ever take for granted what god is doing in this gravel parking lot on old lebanon dirt road that ain't been dirt for 50 years i'm telling you it's beautiful to watch this week we are going to we're, we're going to at least service wise if things break out things break out we're going to have our regular wednesday night men in the morning at six o'clock we'll be in the hospitality room i'll have our our bible study and our prayer time we're not going to forego that we're going to keep our wednesday night i know we've been 11 or 12 nights in a row plus the sundays and so we're just going to have wednesday this week unless the lord sees fit to let things begin to break out more so we're not going to do monday tuesday thursday friday if we pick up the next week or the weekend whatever we'll see i'm gonna give you a little bit of rest Right? Give a little bit of a rest. That doesn't mean don't read your Bible, don't fast, don't pray, don't, don't share your faith and be a soul winner this week. We're just gonna, we're gonna forego actual services, still gonna have a great Wednesday. Listen closely to the words coming out of my mouth. Men, we are still meeting, like I said, this week. You'll get more information later, but it doesn't really matter because we just need you to cover us in prayer. My wife and I are on an unbelievable prophetic assignment this week that we never intended. It was not scheduled. It was not on the books. And something uh, happened literally within the last two and a half days, not even quite three days, that uh, the Lord said, all right, you got to go. You got to go. So for a few days, we're on a very important prophetic assignment. When I tell you, that it is a glorious, glorious opportunity to continue to see the glory and magnitude of God's presence in our church. I'm telling you, it's the facts. You will find out as the week 
lengthens on, if you will, more details. You don't need to know the details right now. It doesn't matter. What you need to do is pray for your pastors. Okay? I'm on a very important assignment this week, spiritually, politically, and in every other way. Okay? So I'm just going to leave it at that right now. Very important. We need God's power. We need God's provision. We need God's protection. We need God's wisdom. The Bible says if you need wisdom, ask the Holy Ghost for it and you'll get it. James 1 5. So we need wisdom. So just pray for your pastors this week. And uh, again, Wednesday night, we'll mash the gas, keep going, whether I'm here or not. Okay, whether I'm here or not, Wednesday night, keep filling the building like you have been. We're going to watch God work and we'll have all of that covered, right? Uh, I'm so glad that we got away from this nonsense of the church having to be built on Greg Locke's personality and when the cat's away, the mice will play. Well, I ain't a cat and you're not mice. Get here on Wednesday night and pray for your pastors. You're going to see some videos this week. You're going to hear some stuff this week. And that's as far as we're going to go. But I'm telling you, we are on maybe, maybe, big capital M-A-B, the most important prophetic assignment of our ministry thus far. And I don't say little silly things like that just to get YouTube clicks. We're banned from YouTube anyhow. Amen. So I'm telling you, pray for us this week. It's important. God's doing something in our church. And he's doing something in the nations. And, uh, and understand this. Here's one of the reasons I know. that you, you do realize that in 19 years, none of you in this room, except maybe people that have been here since 2015. There's only a handful of you that do that. Nobody's ever known me to be gone on a Sunday in 19 years. I've never missed a Sunday. I've missed one Sunday in 2015 because I was doing the world's longest mountain bike race in Canada. Right? And broke my wrist doing that. Should have stayed home and preached. But nonetheless, I mean, think about in 19 years how many Sundays that is. I know most pastors, they miss like 10 or 12 Sundays. And I'm not comparing apples and oranges. I'm just saying, I've never missed a Sunday. I was not supposed to be here today. My wife and I are supposed to be in Argentina preaching a deliverance conference in a soccer stadium right now. Today, this moment, this second. But God had other plans. We moved that meeting to August. Had the tickets bought, the whole deal. So we were supposed to leave yesterday as soon as me and the guys got back on the tour bus from, uh, fr from Arkansas. I can't even remember where I've preached here lately. It's been so many places. And so we were supposed to hop on a jumbo jet and literally right now I should be preaching in Argentina. But God said, nope, not this time. So God knew that, that pieces on the chessboard were going to be moved around when I didn't even know what was coming. So listen, you better learn to trust in what God's doing in your life. You can't always trace where you're going, but you can always trust where he's taking you. Okay? So we're supposed to be in Argentina. I would have missed today and you wouldn't have known it. Okay, because I wasn't going to make a big deal about it. Because if, if you come here for Greg Locke, you need deliverance from man worship. Now, I like to preach, okay? I'm my own favorite preacher. <laughs> I, I'll sign my own Bible, okay? I love to preach. I love it, as you can tell. But this church is about the glory of God, not the personality of your pastor. Understand that. It's important for you to get that. And we turned that curve a long time ago. We had the church crippled for a long time. If I wasn't here, oh, he's not preaching. No, 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 get over that stuff. The Bible's the Bible. I don't care who's preaching. So I'll let you know this week, prophetically, kind of what's going to be going on. And some of you are going to be like, oh, wow, no wonder it didn't build us. But you'll, you'll, it's all good, okay? It's all good. And I uh, promise you it is. And so Wednesday night, it's going to be great. We'll be back later in the week. And uh, we'll mash the gas this next Sunday and see what the Lord has for us. Amen. You promise to pray for us? You promise to pray for us? You promise to pray for us? We need it. So let's pray. I want our men to just begin to uh, bring our buckets down here. We're not going to pass the buckets. I'm just going to let you do your giving this morning as the Lord leads. We don't make a big deal over it. Obviously, we have massive, expensive in-house and online, things we know about, things we don't know about. And many of you know most of everything we bring in, 80% of what we bring in, we give to missionaries, we give to single moms, we give to the widows, we, we help people, we bless people. We're not one of these churches that sit around with millions of dollars in the bank. That's ridiculous. We will never be a church that has gobs of money in the bank. You know why? Because if we believe that Jesus is coming, I'm not leaving the Antichrist anything to spe spend of God's money. Amen. We're going to use it on this community. We're going to feed people, house people, clothe people, bless people. And so the only way we can do that is through the free will offering of God's people. So Father, in the name of Jesus, in this room, on these altar steps, online right now with our hubs and many thousands of people watching, set us loose, set us free, Lord, in a spirit of giving, in a spirit of benevolence, a spirit of sacrifice, a book of acts. 
spirit of excellence when it comes to generosity. So let's bless, Lord, as we give. We thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people, shout it out. All right, as we just begin to worship, let's lift our hands, lift our hearts, bring our offerings to the front, put them in the buckets here. Online, globalvisionbc.com slash G-I-V-E, give. If you want to give the high-tech redneck way, I know many of you do, but let's do our giving today, and I know God's going to honor it. He's going to meet every need we know about, every need we don't know about. Let's worship the Lord. Give me a good hallelujah.
minute ago they gave me the the nod, right? Because they just get to flowing, and so I don't ever know when they're done, and so I don't want to jump in on them. And I've been known to cut off some verses before on accident. But they were getting to the end, and I I looked up and I said, "Can can y'all go into worthy of it all?" And there's a reason I wanted them to go into that because I didn't know what they were singing. They didn't know what I was preaching, but the Lord really downloaded some things to me this morning and spoke to me early in the office. And so it just kind of rearranged my whole direction. And, you know, we're still talking about the glory of God, but it's going to be in a different manifestation this morning in the text. So I just want us to go through the course one more time and just sing, He is worthy of it all. And even while we're singing that, you can... You can start heading back to your seat, or you can be seated, or you can stay. You can run around a tent. I don't care. I don't care. But I, I told them to sing that because I think it's going to, it's going to set the dinner table for what we're about to eat from the meat and the bread of, of the of the Lord's word. Amen. So let's just sing through that chorus that He is worthy of it all. You believe that this morning? He deserves the glory. Give him praise. Give him praise. You can be seated in the house in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, everyone online, for tuning in. We're honored to have you. I want you to turn your Bibles. And I, of course, as a Bible church and a Bible preacher, I believe that Bible preaching should truly and really genuinely come out of the Bible. And so I never apologize for a lot of Scripture. And we're going to use some today. Matter of fact, we're going to develop... Uh, several verses in a couple of very key important chapters and so don't turn off your listening spirit when you hear that I need you to go to Revelation chapter number four would you go there please the book of Revelation and chapter number four we've been of course talking for at least a month and a half now on what does the glory of God produce in our life not lukewarm, limp-wristed, mamby-pamby approach to the things of God, this, this American woke culture. No, no, no. What does it look like when a church is set on fire with God's presence? What does it look like when an individual is set on fire with the presence of the Lord? What does it look like when a home, when a marriage? Let me tell you something. Whether you are married or you are single or you are struggling with either one, know this. Your house can be a place of peace when you walk in. If the glory of God resides there. And I'm not just talking about a walk an aisle, sign a card, pray a prayer, jump in a baptismal dunking tank in a tent somewhere, and then your life, live your life footloose, fancy free, any way you want to. I'm talking about a true, sold out, last days, prophetic commitment to the things of God. Because how many of you know we don't have time to play games? Figure out whose side you're on very quickly. So in Revelation chapter 4 and probably somewhat in chapter 5, we'll peruse through the text. I can get a lot in in a few minutes. I'll preach fast. You listen fast. And if you're done before me, sit there and let me catch up, all right? So this morning, I'm sitting in the office down below the hill, and I was getting ready to go in the book of Numbers because, you know, in our series, we were going to talk about Korah and what happened when he came against Moses and Aaron and deal with the idea that we mentioned a couple of weeks ago in our series that the glory of God will bring about distinction in your life. If you want to know who's for you and who's against you, walk in the glory of God, and God will cut them out of your life for you, okay? God will cut them out of your life for you. You won't even have to do it on Facebook. That's another message. We'll deal with it next week. But while I'm down there, that song came on my playlist on my phone. You are worthy of it all. So I out loud asked the question, do we really believe you are worthy of it all? And the Lord said, that's a message, son. Go to Revelation chapter 4 and prove it to him. 
I like a good challenge from the Lord, amen, so I'm going to Revelation chapter 4, and I'm, I'm going to just verse by verse, line by line, give you some nuggets of spiritual truth as we dig into the gold mine of the Bible here over the next few moments, but let me set the table, let me historically and prophetically set where we are, because this is not necessarily a prophetic message. Everybody says, oh, he's going to preach on Revelation, and he's going to preach on, you know, what's going on in Israel, and he's going to preach about Russia, and Gog, and Magog, and the Antichrist. No, really, I'm not. We may mention some of those things, but here's what you better know. Stop looking for the Antichrist and start being ready for Jesus Christ, because he's about to show up. So, in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, he's dealing with two things. The introduction to his glory, who he is, how radiant he is, how marvelous he is, how wonderful he is, how worthy he is, how holy he is, how patient he is, and how loving he is. And thank God for all of that, because without it, you'd be in hell, and so would I right now this moment. You'd be in hell with a broke back if it wasn't for the mercy, the grace, the patience, and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But then in chapter 2 and 3, he deviates from introduction material and he begins to talk to what we call the seven churches of Asia Minor. He begins with the church at Ephesus. He ends with where we are today in the lukewarm, needs to be called out woke church, the Laodiceans. And in those seven churches, he does two things. He gives them a commendation, what they're doing right. He gives them a condemnation, what they're doing wrong. Now, when Greg Locke is angry with you, whoopee D. When God's not happy, put on some more coffee and pay attention. Can I get a witness? Talk to me today. So in Revelation 2 and 3, he talks to the seven churches of Asia Minor. The ruins are still there to this day. Prophet Joseph Z has been there with his wife this past week. You can go and visit those spots to this very moment. And in those seven churches, he tells them, this is what it looks like when you are cold, when you are lukewarm, as comparatively to what it looks like when a church is hot. Now, we're not preaching on those seven churches. It would take seven months, literally, expositionally to do so. But what we are going to preach on is the moment he gets done concluding his words of affirmation and condemnation to the seven churches, he moves on to something that you better, better bite into today. Revelation 4 and verse 1. After this, shout this. What he means by that is this. After he just spoke to the churches, now he tells the churches what they are to expect. Let me tell you something about the Bible. The Bible was never written for lost people to understand. It was written for God's people to obey. Stop expecting lost people to act the way the Bible says. They're not going to because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are ignorance unto him, so says the Bible in 1 Corinthians. And so I don't expect lost people to live like saved people. I expect saved people to live like saved people. And so does the Lord. So he says, after this, when the church is sitting at attention, he says, now that I have your attention, let me tell you this. I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. That, that high pitch, and when we think about a trumpet, we automatically think about a brass instrument in a symphony. He's talking about a shofar. He's talking about an instrument of a watchman, an Israeli shofar. I heard the voice, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. Here's what the voice said. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Look at me and listen to me, church. There are things that are happening hereafter. Stop being so afraid of the book of Revelation that you don't walk in its daily prophetic fulfillment. We are watching it happen before our eyes in real time. See, here's what our grand folks used to say. Well, you know, it's going to come around to a day when everything just begins to line up and the return of the Lord shall be nigh. Make sure you have oil in your lamps. They said that, but let's be honest. They didn't really mean that because nothing was happening to prove that. You see, in 2020, I don't care what you believe about COVID. In 2020, we jumped prophetically 50 years into the future. With AI, with churches being shut down, with government overreach, we jumped 50 years prophetically. The Antichrist could show up next week and the world would kiss his ring in 24 hours. And I know that to be the facts. And so he said, look, there's some things that are going to happen hereafter. 
There are some things that are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Matthew chapter 24 has already begun. And people say, oh my goodness, is it the end of the world? No, the Bible says it's the beginning of sorrows. It's not the end of the world. So stop getting all tore up about earthquakes. The Bible said they're going to come. Stop getting all tore up prophetically about eclipses. They happen all the time. Did you hear about the eclipse? No, and I'm not really interested in it. You know what I love about an eclipse? It proves that the earth ain't flat. Somebody say amen right there, Global Vision. Thought I'd just stick that in there for a second. But there's some things which much happen hereafter. There are things happening right now. So if it's happening right now, you better buckle in. Because it's about to gear up. About to gear up. I don't want to get ahead of myself, praise God. So let's roll. And immediately I was in the spirit. I can't stop every verse. Or we'll never beat the Methodist to the Mexican restaurant. Amen. But let me tell you how you know when God's speaking. When you get in the spirit. You know why God don't speak? You live in the flesh. You, you live in the flesh. You need deliverance. You need discipline. When you live in the spirit, the spirit can speak to your spirit. People are like, well, I just I don't know. You know, God just don't ever talk to me because you stop listening. You know the number one, shout number one. number one. Number one way to get God to talk to you is to say, Lord, I'll do what you say, I'm listening. You know what he said to every one of these seven churches? He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. James 1, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If you will hear and obey, God will speak to you. No matter where you're at, no matter what situation you find yourself in. So you gotta get in the spirit. So he said, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Thrones in the Bible are pictures of authority, majesty. And there was this throne in heaven and one sat on the throne. And you better know something. The throne's important, but not nearly as important as the one sitting on it. And he that sat, he's going to describe him a little bit. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. You know, words in the Bible mean something. I know it's warm in here. I see you fanning. Just keep on fanning. We got the doors open. But if you think it's hot down there, it's about 15 degrees hotter up here, praise God. He said he's like a jasper and a sardine stone. Why does he use those particular stones? Several reasons. Two are very important. A jasper was what went in the breastplate of the high priest. It was a stone of glory that God would use as a revelatory element to speak to the nation of Israel. And what it's saying here is, the reason there's a jasper stone is because he is our high priest. And he radiates the glory of that position. Then it says there was a sardine stone. That's very interesting. A sardine stone is blood red. Did you hear me? Blood red. Because they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives under the death. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we don't take the blood out of songs or the Bible around here because without the blood, you'll bust tail wide open. That's not popular, but I'm not running for office. I'm telling you what the Bible says. And so then it says, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Meaning by that, it was a rainbow, but the rainbow emitted an emerald-like light. I like that. I'm May, right? May 18th. I'll be 48. I'm an emerald, whatever that means, right? But an emerald has that green hue to it. But here's what's interesting. And, and I can't get sidetracked on this because praise God, scientifically and biblically, I'll just, I'll get to running a, a rabbit and I'll never catch him in time. So let me just say this. It's interesting that the Bible says it's a rainbow, but it's only glistening mainly the color of an emerald. Did you know we have five senses? Because we are limited by a body that we call flesh. But in your heavenly abode, with your heavenly body, you will not have five senses. You will have an unlimited amount of senses that you could never imagine. And when we see a rainbow, we think about Skittles. I know what the culture thinks about, but they ain't stealing it from us. I can promise you that right now. But we only see a certain spectrum of about six colors or less, depending on the hues and the rays of the sun. But in heaven... There are going to be colors that Crayola has never discovered. 
There will be things of color and smell and touch and taste that will blow our minds because our entire spirit man, our spirit being will be able to absorb everything that is there and you can't do it now because your body couldn't handle the overload. So he describes things in the spirit that we have a hard time acknowledging and understanding in the flesh. Does that make sense? Verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. That's authority in the Bible. Sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, I don't have time, again, to theologically develop everything that's about to come out of my mouth, but I need you to, to just follow, take some notes. Short pencil is better than a long memory. Jot a few things down. We'll get back to it at another time. But I've been reading so much Bible, I can't not say this. Does that make sense? I grew up in a denominational vein, and, and many of you did as well, that assume, and that's a dangerous thing to do when it comes to the Bible, that the 24 elders and the thrones they represent, they assume that it's referring to the church. I've heard that my whole life. Anybody that knows anything about what we call dispensational theology, right, would say, oh yeah, those, those 24 elders, they represent the church. Okay, here's a couple of problems with that. The Bible never says that. The Bible never explicitly says who or what they represent, unless, I believe, as I'm going to tell you my lockology opinion, what the Bible does actually say, but it does not say that it is the church. Here's why people from my previous theological mindset, now look, don't start, if you're pre-raptured, don't, don't, don't start throwing maters and taters at me, okay? There's never been an army in the history of the world that was trained to retreat. So you better be careful about all this, let's fight church, let's fight church, and then when the fight breaks out, we get somehow snatched out of here. Hmm? Don't get nervous on me. I'll preach, I'll preach way past lunch. I, I preach more when you get quiet than I do when you shout and running flags around this place. But my previous theological preconditioning was, well, they represent the church because if they represent the church, that means the church is in heaven during the tribulation. But they don't represent the church. That's nowhere in the Bible. It's just not, so I don't care if you're pre-rapture, mid-rapture, no rapture, post-rapture. I don't care what, it doesn't make any difference. Here's what I know. Jesus is coming, and if you don't have oil in your lamp, you're in a jacked up position. That, that's all. I don't care when he's coming. I just know he is. And stuff like happened yesterday proves that he is. But in all this Bible reading that I hope you're reading as a church family, I, I found something gloriously interesting because I've always said, okay, who are the elders? How can I know who they are? Well, I found something interesting in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Don't turn there, just mark it down. We ain't got time to deal with it. You know what I found that one of the last things David did before he commissioned his son Solomon to become the king? He divided the priesthood into 24 divisions. Not 23, not 22, not 48, not 67. He took the priesthood of the Aaron lineage, the Levite lineage, he divided it into 24 sections so that Every single moment of every single day, someone would be in the temple burning incense before God and offering oblations for the sins of the people. 24 priesthood divisions. Now, don't stone me, but I don't think it's too kawinky dinky that Jesus being the high priest over those 24 divisions of the priesthood in Revelation says, I saw 24 elders around the throne. Why? Because if he is the high priest, then he has to be able to take authority over the 24 other priests that are represented around the throne of God. 
It does not represent the church. I'm convinced it represents the priesthood. If you're convinced it represents something else, that's cute. We'll talk about it when I'm not on platform. But at the end of the day, it's not a salvation issue. I'm just saying, stop looking at the Bible through a denominationally corrupted lens that somebody taught you. They said, this is what it means. Okay, show me why it means that. How many times have I got on this platform and publicly repented and apologized for preaching bad theology because the Bible fixed my stupidity? You ought to be able to trust a guy like that. And so... I believe it represents the priesthood because that's who he is. By the way, furthermore, the text is going to bear that out, I believe. But watch this. It says in verse number 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Did you know that there are 21, during the tribulation, from the first three and a half to the last three and a half years, there are 21 cataclysmic judgments, right? Right? There's the seals, there's the bowls, there's the wrath, there's all of that. They're being poured out without mixture. But it's interesting, Pastor Jesse, that when I preach the Bible and read the Bible and study the Bible and memorize the Bible and get less denominational in my approach to the Bible, I find out there's actually more. Because here's what the Bible says. There were seven thunders that nobody ever talks about. Do you know why we don't talk about them? Because the Bible says that John, the revelator, got ready to write down what he heard in the seven thunders. And the Holy Spirit said, put your pen up, close your journal, don't write it. The people can't handle it. There's 28 judgments in the Revelation. Seven of which we don't even know about because God said they're so bad, you wouldn't believe me if I put it in the Bible. And shame on the American church, we don't even believe what he has put in the Bible. And so he said, look, there's going to be some thundering, some voices, lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are, watch this, these lamps of fire that are burning. I got to go quick on this. This is good stuff. Which are the seven, shout seven, seven. spirits of God. Now, there's been people that got some hodgepodge theology and went crazy. and said, well, I thought it was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? There's seven in one? No, no. These are seven manifestations of the same Holy Spirit. Seven ways that God reveals himself. Somebody says, well, why would he say seven spirits of God and leave it open-ended? He doesn't. In Isaiah 11 and verse 2, he tells you what the seven spirits of God are. Verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. We're talking about the Messiah. And a branch, capital B, that's Jesus, shall grow out of his roots. Listen to this. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So we know that the Spirit of the Lord is what we would call the Holy Spirit. You tracking with me? So start counting. You got the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's the seven ways that God manifests the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits that are before God. It is amazing what you learn when you put down Netflix and pick up a Bible. So he said, there's these seven spirits. That's all we'll talk about on that. Verse six, keep rocking. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, there were, watch this, four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Like a, like a spider head. I don't even like them. Eyes before and behind. See, we have been so <laughs> lulled to sleep by going to Walmart and seeing these little half-naked chubby babies flying around with two wings coming out of their back. We've been so cupidified, we don't even know what an angel looks like. But if you read a Bible, they crazy looking. I mean crazy radiating. I mean some stuff that we can't even hardly believe and wouldn't believe if it wasn't in the Bible. Ezekiel, when he talks about the Ophanim, the wheel inside the wheel and the eyes rolling inside the eyes and the wheels and the eyes and the eyes and the wheels, I'm like, holy smokes. It don't look like... <laughs> these little sissy-fied, you know, pamper-wearing people flying around on a cloud. 
These beasts, these creations of God, which by the way, we will know them to be angels in a moment. Watch what it says, that they were flying around and watch what they were, verse 7. The first beast was like a lion. That was a representation of authority. Authority. The second beast like a calf. That is a representation of sacrifice. Sacrifice. But then notice this. The third beast had the face as of a man. That's a representation of intelligence. Because man is separated from the animal kingdom and the fact that we have divine intelligence given to us by God because we're made in God's image and monkeys aren't. Amen. And then he says, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. That's the majesticness, the swiftness of how these creatures operate. Now check this out, verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six, circle that, wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and watch what they do. They rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. They do this without stopping, without rest, without feeling repetitious or in rote. Holy, 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 holy. How long have they been doing it and will they do it day and night? The Bible said. You know how I know who these creatures are? Revelation teaches us that this is the same crew that Isaiah prophetically talked about. Isaiah 6 and verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood angels, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his feet, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he did fly. And one cried and said unto the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They were made for one purpose. Holy, 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 holy. And if you knew what angels knew, you'd clean your life up. They're shouting the holiness of God. It's the only thing they can proclaim and never get bored doing it. And some of y'all get twice the frame if we go 35 minutes in a song service. I know I'm preaching the choir, but I just feel froggy and we'll jump a little bit. People online, well, you know, I just tune in for the preaching. They, they don't sing my kind of songs. We ain't singing them to you, bucko. I ain't here to worship your holiness. I'm here to worship his holiness. We didn't write the songs for you. Holy, 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 holy. If you get bored in church, I can't help you. I tell people all the time, if you can fall asleep while I'm preaching, you've earned every second of it. I'll never wake you up. You've earned it. You're tired. But life's too short to raise your family in a boring church. Way too short. Verse 9, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, that authority, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down. So I don't care who you think they are, but you better know, regardless if it's the church or the priesthood, both of them fall before Jesus. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. Let me tell you something about crowns. There are five major crowns, we don't have time to deal with it, that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter under Holy Spirit inspiration tell us that we can have as believers. Matter of fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not unto me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. There are five crowns that you can earn. The Bible even says, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. There's a martyr's crown for people that are willing to die for their faith. And I can promise you, it'll be a small percentage of people that get the martyr's crown. We might as well say there's four crowns you can get because 99.9% .9 of people around the planet will never get the martyr's crown because they claim they'll die for something they don't even go to church for. 
I, I loved it during COVID. Oh, we will go to prison for our faith. I'm like, you don't even go to church for your faith. You're going to go to jail for it? You can't even crawl out of bed and get there? What? Anyhow. So it's very simple. They take their crowns and they throw them down. You see, the purpose of crowns is not so we can walk around wearing them on our head and like, oh, good giggly wiggly, what out a great preacher. Didn't I sing well? Didn't I prophesy well? Look at my clothes. Look at my business. Look how blessed I am. Oh, bling for the king. Now look, God will give you bling for the king, but you get to give it back to the king. It ain't your bling. It ain't for you. They cast their crowns at the feet. And notice what they said, verse 11. We just sang it. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Not O preacher. Not O president. No, no, no. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. See how plain that is? All things. All things. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Somebody's like, well, you know, I would just like to know why God created everything. He just told you, for his pleasure, for his glory, for his honor. Because he wanted to and didn't have to get my vote of confidence. He never asked my permission. Can I do this, Greg Locke? And guess what? He never will. If God ever asks your permission to do something, it's not God. You hear me? God don't need a vote of confidence. And so they proclaim his redemption, his creation, his honor, his glory, his majesty. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him, watch this, that sat on the throne. Now, wait a minute. He just talked about the person sitting on the throne, previous chapter. But now he said the person on the throne has a book to be differentiated from the person that's about to snatch the book out of his hand. Okay? Please get that in your theological understanding. Different. The glory, the radiance of God is on the throne. But somebody's about to take the book from the one sitting upon the throne. His name's Jesus, by the way. So it's not that he's not enthroned, but you have to understand that Jesus is in subjection to the will of God the Father, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's always been in submission to the will of his Father, even in this text. And so watch what happens. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. No worry, I'm not going to extrapolate and preach on the seven seals. That'd take a long time. Not going to do it today. And I saw a, watch these this phrase, it's very important. It's why words need to be captured. And I saw a strong angel. Uh, let, me, let me rewind. And I saw a strong angel. Now look, we know that they are strong without the adjective to tell me that it is. He doesn't have to give me the extra. Oh, by the way, he's a strong angel. No, angels are naturally strong. But a strong angel? I mean, I mean, think about, just to put this into perspective, in 2 Kings chapter 19, don't turn there. You know what one non-strong angel did? Killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers of Sennacherib in a half a verse. And it wasn't even a Planet Fitness angel. It's just a regular one. This wasn't even a military angel. One angel wasn't even considered strong. Just an angel stood in a valley and slew in half a verse 185,000 people. One angel. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, and in heaven, there was a strong angel. 
A regular angel kills 185,000. A strong angel can't even break a seal on a book. Help me, Holy Ghost. A regular angel kills 185,000 people with an angelic sword. And doesn't even get heartburn. Doesn't have to sit down and rest. Nothing. 185,000 of them, they're dead. But a strong angel in the presence of God can't even break a seal on a book. Because there's only one person designed to break that seal. And it's a strong savior, not a strong angel. And a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? Who's worthy to open the book? Apparently not him. And to loose the seals thereof. You see, the purpose of the book was not just to open it and read it. The purpose of the book was to open it so that it read everybody on the earth. Seven seals about to break plumb loose. Now watch this. And no man, verse 3, in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now think about that. He said, there ain't a man on the earth, ain't a man in heaven, and ain't a person in hell that's under the earth that can open the seals, neither to look thereon. Them jokers can't even look at it. Not only can you not break the seal, you can't even look at what's written on it. So says the strong angel, verse 5. And one of the elders, oh, excuse me, verse 4. And I wept much. I mean, you, you can imagine. Here's, the, here's a prophetic man getting a revelatory download right in the book of Revelation. And he's like, man, I want to see what's in them seals. And, and John, the revelator, falls down. Ooh, he just begins to squall. He's like, I can't even see what I'm supposed to prophesy about. And he's weeping. He's crying. Snotting all over the place. And check this out. I wept much. Why? Because no man was found worthy. Notice, you're not worthy, I'm not worthy, they're not worthy, only he's worthy. Amen? And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, dry it up. Behold, that's a coffee drinking word. It means you better look out for what comes next. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. Why? Because he said in John 19, 30, it is finished. He has prevailed. There's been millions and millions and millions and millions and did I say millions of people that have visited the tomb in Jerusalem. But Jesus ain't never been back in it. He has prevailed. What does the prevailing allow him to accomplish? To open the book and to loose the seals thereof. He is the one that has the authority because of his prevailing victory to open the seals and to justifiably let what happens to the earth when the seals are broken happen and still be God. People are like, well, you know, I just, I just don't think I ever want to serve a God that's just so mean and vindictive. Stop all that. Why is there so much evil in the world? Look, God gave you the keys to the car and you put it in the ditch. And then he came back with a wrecker truck with a big cross on the back of it and pulled you out. And you still got a proclivity to throw it in the ditch. Atheists are like, well, if there was a God, there wouldn't be so much evil in the world. So I'm like, okay, do you believe in God? No. Then why is there still so much evil in the world? You see... He has the right to judge his creation without your permission. I just don't think that's fair. It doesn't matter what you think. Did you know you're a creature of dirt? I'm a glorified mud ball from the hand of God. And the Lord God formed a man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. You are a creature of dirt. And we dare 
lift our dust-filled hands to the glory of an all-holy, righteous, supreme, sovereign God of the universe. And you think a God that big has to stoop to listen to dirt creatures because you don't like a decision that God made. You better get over it real fast, honey. Real fast. He is worthy to loose the seals. Verse 6, we about done. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, capital L, as it had been slain, having, watch this position of authority, seven horns, complete, divine, authoritative interaction before God, seven horns and seven eyes. Which are, what are they? We just read them. Seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This lamb. Now, things about to get dicey here in verse 7. Remember I told you there was somebody on the throne with the book. And somebody that came to snatch it out of the hand of him that was on the throne. That's the son. Watch this, verse 7. And he came. That's the lamb. Just read about him. There's no other context, no other description. He came and took the book out of the right, that's authority in the Bible, hand of him that sat upon the throne. The angel said, I know my buddy over here killed 185,000 Assyrians of Sennacherib in a valley in one night and half a verse. And I'm stronger than he is, but I can't bust this book, can't even look at it. The elder said, weep not, for there's one that is here that can open, read, and understand and unleash the contents of this sealed book. And he walks over and literally snatches it out of the hand of God the Father. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four bees and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. Wait, 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 back up. How come they just did that? They didn't. This is not repetition. You know what the previous chapter said? They fell down before him that was on the throne. Get, get, get your theology correct. They fell down before him that was on the throne. Now, understanding that the one that snatched the book had just as much power, Godhead, divinity, and authority as the one on the throne. For I and my Father are one, so says Jesus. Now they fell down not before the throne, but before the Lamb. Before the Lamb. I'm going to ask you something. It's going to seem abrasive, but I'm going to ask you anyhow because I feel like to, like I need to. Why is it that angels, beasts, and elders in heaven willingly, faithfully fall down and submit themselves to Jesus and earth-dwelling dirt creatures question God and do not submit themselves and think they're going to make it to God's kingdom. Hell will be packed. With sincerely influential people that bowed their knee to a culture but never bowed their knee to a savior. And they fell before him in reverence. Having every one of them, watch this, harps, even in heaven there's that music. Golden vials full of odors. Now notice who this is. These are the beasts. These are the 24 elders. What do they have? Golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Who was in control other than God in the Old Testament of the prayers and the rituals of the saints? The priesthood. The priesthood. And the priesthood had these vials that were the prayers of the saints. Did you know God hears every prayer, puts it in a bottle, tucks it away? And even your prayers will meet you. At the kingdom of God's throne one day. And then it says in verse 9. And they sung a new song. 
See, some of y'all can't understand that because y'all still too busy singing them old songs. <laughs> it's hard to understand the glory of God when you still worship at the altar of there's a tear in my beer because I'm crying for you, dear. Huh? Look, I'm not going to get sidetracked. It's getting hot in here. I got to get you out. But I'm going to tell you why some of y'all can't submit to the Bible because you too submitted to Beyonce. Hmm? She, she doesn't let the whole world know she's a full-blown witch and you get mad at me every time that name comes out of my mouth. Hmm? So, some of y'all can't rejoice in the new song because you've been still corrupted by the old song. You better fill yourself with some worship. Give God something to work with. Everybody okay? They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain. <laughs> Listen. Never allow, this is important. If it, I, I've given you a lot of little nuggets today. I'm hoping this is one of the, the best words I'm going to give you right now. Please get this. Never allow someone who didn't die for you dictate how you worship the one that did. <laughs> he was slain, nobody else, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. See, there's abrasive words in the Bible that we need to use. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Listen to me. Man, I could go 6,000 ways from Sunday right now. Let me go ahead and get the pianist up here. I'm about to roll. Y'all got, got to dial me in, praise God. Let me tell you something about the kingdom of God. There ain't an ounce of racism in it. You hear me? An ounce of racism in God's kingdom. Every nation, every skin color, every size, every shape, every language, every tribe, every last one of them. You better get used to multicultural worship here because you're going to have it up there for a long time. We've seen so many fake pictures in the Bible of a hippie white Jesus. We, we think Jesus is like American. Look, I love this nation. The whole thing's going to go to pot one day, whether you save it now or not. But I'm going to tell you something. The last word of the Bible is not hashtag America. There's only one nation God's got a special covenant with, and it ain't this one. It's Israel, and the only reason God blesses us is because we got a special covenant with Israel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm about to get tired. I'm about to. Mm. Every tongue, every people, every kindred, every nation, red, yellow, black, and white, red, yellow, black, and white. If you are racist, you are not saved. If you don't like black people, white people, green people, Asian people, you are not born again. Did you hear me? You cannot be saved and be a racist. Amen. She just let me know I'm on track. Praise God. You can't be saved and be a racist. You just can't. Okay, what color you are. You, you better celebrate all colors. You better celebrate all colors. Heaven's going to be a big divine mix of them. Hmm? Big divine mix. I see my little grand boy running around. Listen. He, I take him like the Dunkin' Donuts. People look at me like, You see, heaven, heaven going to be a mixture. Anybody?
Heaven going to have all kind of colors, all kind of races, all kind of, yeah, I know, she's cooler than me. I like hugging on her too. Hey, can you pray for me? Thank you. Train them right. Every color, every nation, every tribe, every tongue will be at the kingdom of God. You better have a church like that. We, we better stop all this foolishness. Well, I go to a white church. I go to a black church. I go to God's church. Woo! Hot dog. I better get on track. We got visitors here, amen. But notice, I am going to quit. I'm not done. I'm just going to quit. Verse 10. He has made us unto our God kings and priests. You see, I, I don't have to have a king or a priest take me into the presence because the veil's been torn. He's made me a king and a priest. Let, let me tell some of y'all something by way of application. Some of y'all need to learn to walk in your royalty. You let people walk over you like a doormat. You let people treat you crazy. You speak narcissistic word curses of witchcraft over your life. Tell you you're a loser. You'll always be fat. You'll always have crooked teeth. God can't love you. You'll, you'll always be broke. You'll never have a good marriage. You'll never have good kids. Yada, 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 shmada. You royalty. You're a king. You're a queen. Because God said so. And we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. God's going to change the whole thing. And I beheld. And I heard the voice of many angels. Round about the throne. And the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000. Times 10,000. And thousands of thousands. Sang with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb. That was slain. To receive power and riches and wisdom and strength. And honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them are heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Get on your feet and give him some glory in his house this morning, church. Some of you right now, right now, just need to come and get on these steps and say, God, I submit to the Lamb. I submit to the Lord. I submit to the one that is worthy. Just come and worship Him. You got burdens? Lay them down. You got sin? Lay it down. You got rebellion? Lay it down. You got sickness? Lay it down. You got bankruptcy? Lay it down. You got divorce? Lay it down. You got an addiction? Lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it down. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy. He's worthy. We have our crew over here getting ready for our baptismal celebrations. If you're going to be baptized today, if you're praying, take your time. If you need prayer, we'll lay hands on you. But if you're going to be baptized, just go ahead. We got little baptismal change in booths if you need it. Before or after, just slip over there. We'll get your name tag, get your towel, we'll line you up. We're going to start baptizing you in the name of the Lord. If you've been saved but you've never been water baptized, today's your day. Today's your day. Today's your day. Since COVID broke out, God's let us baptize 14,000 people in this tent, in that tub right over there. I'm telling you, today's your day. Today's your day. If you're down here and you need specific prayer, or if you're not yet but you need to come, slip your hand up. We'll get somebody to lay hands on you. We'll pray over you. We'll help you right here. Prayer team right here. Right here. Thank you. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. They're just going to worship. You pray. We never have an official dismissal. We just say we'll see you next service. So, men, I'll see you in the morning at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night. I want you here. No matter what, I want you here. Pray for your pastors this week. We have a huge prophetic assignment. We need your covering. We need your prayers. We need you to fast for us for a day. I'm telling you, it's big stuff. It's big stuff. So no official dismissal. We'll see you in the morning, men. We'll see you Wednesday night. Get around, love each other, hug each other. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to move into baptismal celebration. God's going to set some people free. It's going to be beautiful today in the house of the Lord. If you're glad you came today, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just... I just got a reminder. Listen, I, I know a lot of you got schedules and stuff, but this is cool. We got some crazy things going on in our church. One of the things that we have that they've been gearing up for for this summer is our new crew wrestling. We have a we have a spiritual gospel wrestling association in our church under Brother Judd Cox. And 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 they, they're gonna they're doing some exhibition. They've been practicing a lot. They're doing some exhibition. I'm gonna go watch my son either whoop up on somebody or get whooped up on. They got the good guys and the bad guys. 2 30, right? 2 30 today, out in the back of the parking lot. We got that big old wrestling ring. And man, let's just come get some poster boards and shout and scream for these people. Amen. And they're getting ready to have a big, huge match where they preach the gospel and we bring lost people in that, that love wrestling from the community. So they've been practicing hard. So 2 30 today, let's get there and let's watch that crew wrestling. Amen. It's only a global vision. Do you have a spiritual wrestling team? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm excited. 2.30. Back parking lot. According to your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, dear brother, to baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism. Praise to walk in newness of life. My brother Jeff, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, dear sir, to baptize you today. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bear the baptism. Raise to walk in innocent life. Hallelujah.
invite Sister Emily upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and the power and glory of his gospel. It gives me a great honor today before these witnesses to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Married in baptism. Praise the walk in newness of life. God.